Hello, hello everyone. Uh, good morning for those who are listening from uh, North America and uh, hello to uh, European ones. So, welcome to this uh, webinar uh, dedicated to uh, cybersecurity trends after the event that happened last week, uh, the FIC. So, uh, I'm Thomas uh, Fauvel. Uh, your moderator today. Uh, I'm deep tech industry expert at Choose Paris region. Uh, please welcome uh, my speakers today uh, to discuss this topic. Please, Jérôme, uh, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Uh, so I'm Jérôme Debonnet, uh, cybersecurity CTIO for Capgemini. So CTIO stands for Chief Technology and Innovation Officer. I'm also Chief Security Architect for the Cloud Infra Services, Insight and Data, which stands for the Data Analytics and Artificial Intelligence uh, Global Business Unit, <coughs> and also advisor for the Capgemini Venture uh, part of Capgemini. Thank you, Jérôme. Excellent. Um, and Sylvain, can you also introduce yourself, yourself please? Sure. Hi, everybody. So I'm Sylvain. Uh, I have several hats. Uh, one of those is um, I'm the editor of uh, Shakers. That's a newsletter, weekly newsletter on cybersecurity and digital, focusing on the responsibility that we collectively have experts in the industry and just everyone has with cyber. Uh, I'm also an advisor for several companies for example, banks with cybersecurity programs. Uh, and I happen also to be uh, an entrepreneur uh, with a startup uh, as well. So yeah, I'm very happy to be with you today. Thank you to both of you. And uh, before we have this uh, exciting panel discussion, I would like to introduce who is and what is Choose Paris Region. So we are a public funded organization uh, with a simple mission is to support every uh, foreign company willing to uh, set up an entity in Paris region and create local jobs. Uh, we are uh, offering these services free of charge from a uh, discovery stage where you need to know what are the uh, events, the uh, different um, programs. Uh, in the planning stage as well, when we help you uh, uh, design your go-to-market strategy or uh, access some, some partners, we, uh, of course, and this is what why, why we exist, uh, this is when you need to set up, uh, we are the one-stop shop for every legal uh, steps from finding a banker, an accountant, a lawyer, uh, finding an office space. When you are already set up and you want to accelerate your growth in Paris region, uh, you can uh, rely on us to uh, find the uh, best support available like uh, research tax credit uh, which is very generous in France uh, and any other national regional and even at EU level uh, grants that you uh, may deserve so uh, first uh, why choose Paris region in a few key figures uh, choose Paris region is uh, offering the first concentration of Fortune 500 HQs in Europe mm -hmm. and the third in the world after Greater Beijing and Greater Tokyo. So many opportunities in nearly every sector from uh, finance and uh, insurance, uh, banks uh, to uh, large uh, industrials, energy players, uh, car manufacturer. It's really broad and it's a very wealth of opportunity. It's also a talent pool. Paris region hosts the quarter of the whole French student population and uh, concentrates uh, many decision centers, but also research capacity uh, every year, uh, private and uh, private and public labs uh, in Paris region only spend more than 20 billion euros in research. It's also a very uh, intensive startup region uh, where there are 
more than 8,000, some people say up to 12,000 startups uh, in the uh, Paris region. But uh, the picture you have here is uh, one of the famous Station F uh, that hosts uh, 1,000 startups under the same roof. So let's talk about cybersecurity now and uh, all the uh, important figures you should know about the market in France first, cybersecurity and digital trust uh, counts for nearly 15 billion euros of revenue uh, and it's growing fast, uh, making France the second market in Europe and uh, as I said, also a talent pool in this sector. The uh, dynamic of the ecosystem can be seen through the uh, uh, dynamic of the startup. Uh, there are uh, more than 160 startups in France and 60% of them are located in Paris region. The majority uh, of them are in uh, INAM, are in data security, but in any other sectors. The uh, fundraising in France uh, has, uh, has seen a, a big boom last year uh, due to, uh, not only, but due to the large amount raised by Ledger, the French unicorn in cybersecurity, uh, but also to uh, the growth, uh, notable growth of uh, the scale-ups. For sure, this uh, success and uh, this maturity uh, comes also from a long-lasting existence of uh, leaders uh, such as uh, Atos, Accenture, Capgemini, uh, of course, but many others, uh, medium-sized uh, players and also uh, scale-ups and startups. The uh, ecosystem is well-structured around uh, big uh, research players and uh, clusters such as uh, Systematic Paris Region, the deep tech uh, cluster of Paris Region or Exatrust, which, which is purely um, uh, focusing on uh, digital trust and cybersecurity uh, companies. So uh, one of them is quite famous now. It's the Compass Cyber, uh, located in the uh, business district, uh, western of Paris. Uh, it hosts in this huge uh, facility, uh, startups, VCs, schools, uh, and uh, public and private research uh, in the same building for the maximum of uh, synergies. The long-lasting cyber at Station F uh, offers uh, a six months program uh, to accelerate your business in France. Uh, it's hosted by Thales and really, uh, really a, a, a factory of uh, success stories. It hosts uh, really well international companies. France uh, is investing uh, heavily in uh, the cybersecurity uh, research uh, mainly, but uh, this 1 billion plan uh, up to uh, 2030 is aiming at making uh, France ready for the challenge of the future. So I hope to meet you at one of these events that I selected for you. Uh, one is next week in Paris, uh, others are in November. There, there is. Uh, I, I, I would just suggest you to uh, to attend a very specific one, which is Paris Cyber Summit. If you need top level meetings uh, with uh, um, state level uh, deciders and a very intimate uh, one with e-crime and cybersecurity uh, uh, happening every year, the uh, Millipol is uh, dedicated to security, but more and more uh, offering connections in the uh, cybersecurity world as well. Uh, maybe you have other suggestions uh, to, to add to this list. Yeah, there was uh, in, in Monaco, uh, les assises de la cybersecurité, for, mainly for the French speaking, but uh, yes, uh, English natives are also welcome. Uh, more okay, more. Les, les assises de la cybersecurité uh, in Monaco. Okay. And that's a nice place to be. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
the uh, FIC last week uh, was main, maybe the, the, the most important event uh, in, the, uh, in the industry, uh, a huge event for Europe, and uh, it's happening in the north of France, in Lille, uh, every year. Uh, we have a second edition now that is uh, standing in Montreal uh, in October. So I hope to uh, meet you th meet you there. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I'm looking forward to uh, meeting you at uh, RSA conference in San Francisco. Uh, feel free to uh, book a meeting. You will find a, a link to my uh, dedicated agenda uh, in uh, the chat. I also have my newsletter, which is uh, generally around uh, digital uh, opportunities, uh, digital market opportunities in the Paris region. So I also invite you to subscribe. Uh, the link to the uh, registration page is in the chat as well. So thank you for your attention. Yeah. By the way, I will also be at the RSA conference. So. Ah, in case it's <laughs> that could be also way. So, thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Sylvain, for being here. And uh, it's time now to uh, to discuss uh, the the trends that we have seen during uh, the FIC last week, and maybe also the different insights that you have as the, uh, cyber, cyber security experts. Um, first of all, uh, like many people, many people in the business uh, think um, changing from one continent to another is mainly a question of regulation. You have to be fully aware of uh, what uh, what is changing in the uh, regulation when you come to Europe. And th there are many, many changes uh, these last uh, years and months, uh, as we have seen uh, the emergence of the Data Act, the NIS2, DORA for finance, uh, EIDAS uh, for identity, uh, SHREM2 for the banks, if I'm correct. Uh, we have seen also big um, will to protect the cloud, the European cloud uh, in Gaia X. This makes really things complex. And uh, your view on the most important part of these regulation changes uh, is more than welcome. So what would be your uh, first uh, uh, point of view? Uh, so all this is, is it a, a set of new constraints or uh, is it opportunities for newcomers coming out of the EU and uh, willing to succeed here? Constraints or opportunities? Opportunities, definitely, I would say. <laughs> uh, I won't say constraints because when you look at it, it's year for years and it's adding more maturity when you look at it. Uh, good example, NIS2, it's just a new set of bit more strengths on NIS1 and so on and so forth. So when you look at it, if you know that for quite a long time, and as you see with my hair, I've done that for a long time. Uh, okay, fair enough, that's more. And if you go in US or other part of the world, it's just another regulation. And if you look at it in the real life, okay, it might be a bit different wording to say it, but in the essence, it's not so much different in, in the way to address it. The essence is the same. It's to protect the individual, it's to protect their data. Then, of course, you have some geopolitics on top of it, but the essence is more or less the same. So then it's an opportunity. You need to adapt a little bit, but it's more or less the same. If you're in Germany, in France, in uh, Netherlands, the essence will be the same. So that's really that. And you see that that kind of regulation to protect data, you have it now uh, in Singapore, in China also, with a different view, but then it's more or less the same essence. 
So at the end of the day, it's an opportunity. When you want to tackle that globally, it's an opportunity. So that's the, the, the way to see it. I agree with you uh, on that. Sylvain. Yeah, may, Jerome, I totally agree with you on that. It's an opportunity. And even for uh, regulations that are not so new, for example, GDPR, in many ways for companies, even, even big companies, they still have challenges in implementing it, which is a bit striking when you consider it's uh, already in 2018 that they should have been ready, right? But uh, even for, for a company to have uh, a set of several thousands of applications compliant to GDPR is still a strong challenge. And there are many of those companies in France, as you know, those CAC 40 companies, SBF 120 listed companies, even some NGOs are in France. So there's an untapped market of companies who need to have the scale uh, that um, players coming from the US and elsewhere internationally, they can bring so that they tackle once, maybe not for all, but at least with a more, uh, more definitive approach to it than they use in the past. So GDPR, for example, is also an opportunity for new approaches to make those companies compliant as well. Um, and as, as you mentioned, Thomas, uh, uh, of course, uh, the SREMS 2 uh, recommendations from the EDPB. So the EDPB is the uh, what is the, the the policy maker? Well, the the uh, responsible for everything related to data protection at the EU level, uh, and they made recommendations um, on the transfer of personal data outside of the EU, uh, depending on the country uh, where the regulation is considered at risk for eavesdropping, dropping, for example. Um, and so EDPB mandated every company doing this kind of external transfer outside of the EU, export of data, um, to be compliant by the end of, guess what, last year. And so many companies are still struggling with what is the best approach that they can take to tackle this. And I'm sure there are um, interesting products and approaches, operating models that you can bring to the market to accelerate this, for example, with um, encryption, a differential encryption, anonymization, uh, solutions like that, but also approaches that allow to tackle it at scale. So regulation can also be an opportunity to, to address with a more massive and accelerating approach. Yeah, yeah, I can illustrate that. Uh, uh, for example, uh, as you know, I'm working with VCs, uh, so I'm also helping uh, some VCs to uh, uh, acting as a board advisor here for some startup that they found uh, to to secure the growth of their startup. Uh, so helping them on the technology part or go to market part and so on. And those kind of regulations is also helping to uh, think in a different way think out of the box. Uh, and for example, uh, in that particular case, uh, you can also think in a way to use the technology in a different way and avoid storing GDPR, PII data, for example, using them, but avoid storing them. So it's a different way. And you start to find startups thinking like that. So it's a very different way to think. And then you can combine authentication, for example, uh, checking ID papers and so on without storing the data. But then you can do the check, check the real identity, the live identity of someone without storing the data. And then you're still compliant. And you can do, you can do in banking, you can do KYC using that kind of technology. So that's exactly the, the opportunities, exactly what we were saying. That's an opportunity to really seek in a different way. So that's definitely what those regulations can bring. So if you're stick in the old mindset, it can be a constraint. But if you start to think out of the box, then it's an opportunity. And that's what we find. And here I'm talking about a French startup, for example, uh, who is based in Paris. So that's exactly that. Uh, that goes with that. And it's uh, 
two ladies, PhD, who, who have grown that idea. And that's exactly that. You need newcomers in the, in the domain, and that's exactly the kind of opportunities that we have. Yeah. Okay. So it opened doors to, to newcomers. That's that's good news. Um, but there are big uh, big challenges. Uh, I mean, larger than these. Uh, it's uh, this kind of uh, will to to increase sovereignty uh, around cloud capacity uh, in Europe. Can you can you tell us more about uh, the, the the state of develop, stage of development of this um, uh, Gaia X initiative? And uh, why is it not yet implemented? Um, is it also something that uh, makes things difficult to to enter the market for foreign companies? It can be perceived as a difficulty for mm -hmm. I think several things. Uh, first thing, and that's the same for any company. If you come to a foreign country with the mindset of coming with your habits, with your mentality, then it's always hard because you need to know the market, you need to know the local, uh, uh, the local regulation, the local laws, uh, the local way of working. Uh, because at the end of the day, even if it's IT, that's a people uh, market. So if you don't know how it works, it will be hard to, to set up. And if you don't know that, yeah, that's a pain. Uh, and I think it's a key point here. Uh, we saw that when you start to create teams like GAIX, uh, mixing those uh, teams from around the world without creating, which what has happened in GAIX, without creating that unity of mindset of people, then it's very hard. And it takes time to create that. And that's why it has not came out on the ground immediately. You need to give time to that kind of big community mm -hmm. to, to create something which is really happening. So it will take time yet. To yeah, and um, to just to, to remind um, uh, attendees that uh, nearly 70% of the cloud is managed uh, by, uh, in Europe, is managed by uh, American uh companies such as aws uh, uh, microsoft and and google so um this capacity uh, won't change from american hands to european hands in one click of course okay. but uh, uh yes you need to think in a different way to to adapt that mm. uh, and, and it's a discussion that needs to happen mm. and when you need to adapt something which is US-based to European-based with the regulation, it's not only technical, it's process, it's people, and it's, it's techniques. Mm -hmm. And when you need to mix that, that takes time. Uh, and that's really that. And then, obviously, when you add the geopolitics, <laughs> it takes even more time. <laughs> uh, so then, then you have to think out of the box on something on top, and that's where I believe that adding uh, differential encryption, homomorphic encryption, and so on, will help to solve. Uh, I think it's really there. And also, it took a lot of time for people to understand that Claude, with the shared responsibility model, at company level, you need to take that in account. You're always responsible of the data, of the identity, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And even that in the Gaia X uh, team, it, it will take them time to make the customer learn that yet, because it's a big company level, very mature company. They understand it, but you have everyone in the panel to address. And it will continue to take them to take time here. Okay. If, if so any, any advice? Yeah, sure. I could add to that maybe one point. In, in addition to uh, the sort of sovereignty or digital independence issues with cloud, there is also the, let's say, the, the dependency that any client has when they invest with a cloud provider, a CSP, and any of those. Uh, if you take AWS, if you take Azure, if you take uh, uh, 
PCP, uh, the more you invest, the more you use them, the more you become dependent of them. Um, one of those or, or several of those. And uh, it, well, the companies, they tend to select one, um, sometimes two, but mostly one of those. And it's a challenge for them to, um, to be cloud agnostic, actually. So may, maybe for, for, the, for the provider that, that you are or the, the technology, uh, uh, technology companies that you are, the challenge is more to become cloud provider agnostic than uh, being uh, sovereign compatible in a way. Because if you're cloud provider agnostic, then you can tackle the specificities of the EU, France, and maybe another region as well, because of course you want to, to go to several regions also in, in Asia at some point. And the more specific things you do, the, the more cost it, it uh, impairs to your product, of course, and, and maintenance. So I think one of the challenges that we are facing in cybersecurity and in, in digital in many ways is more interoperability, more uh, standardization of the technology itself. Not not only in ISO standards, for example, and that can be a way to uh, to also reassure the European and the French market with the challenges they have, for example, with a uh, with the Cloud Act, for example. I like it. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, advice. And the being a cloud agnostic is really key. Yeah. And that's also an opportunity for startups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you want the to cloud provider, we push exactly in the opposite way because that's their interest, to generate more revenue. So you need someone on top uh, to, to, to create diagnostic, diagnosticity. Yeah. And of course, um, microservices, Docker-based, uh, and uh, Kubernetes is a way to get to that, but it's, made, it's not the entire solution. OK, there are other, other paths uh, <laughs> that we can discuss uh, maybe in another uh, edition of this yeah. uh, excellent discussion um, but I'd like to uh, thank you for for this first uh, discussion around uh, regulation and new new standards and uh, big big trends I mean at uh, this level I would like to go a bit uh, uh, and focus a, a bit more on uh, the technological approaches that are uh, trending um, of course, uh, zero trust is uh, the uh, principle now for uh, most of the uh, offers. Um, so worldwide, uh, it has been adopted, uh, but it seems that um, it uh, it reached an inflection point uh, with a thirty uh, percent yearly growth in uh, in certain sectors. What what about Europe? Zero trust is is still at this. Uh, Pace. Well, it's still growing quite fast. Yeah, we depend on the sector, of the vertical. Uh, I see big traction and big projects uh, coming in other, uh, depending the vertical. Yeah. So globally, there's still a lot of room for uh, for interesting projects. What I see also is the limits of the current architectural zero trust. When you look at it, it relies on few providers globally, mainly US-based. So there's opportunity for uh, for Europe. And there's kind of a fallacy in the zero trust concept, which is basically you trust someone, a provider here, which is the SASE, the SSE, CASB uh, provider, because you offload part of your security Mm -hmm. to a trusted third party to inspect your data, which is good because you offload part of your risk. But then you provide the access to part of your data here inside your network traffic to someone else. So I see the raise of another approach, uh, which I call, because I did not find an explicit name on the market, so which I call zero knowledge, zero knowledge network, zero knowledge identity here. Uh, which allow to use another provider which use multiple layers of encryption. So this provider is blind of the, of the data and you don't 
increase your attack surface, not opening network ports and so on. So it mm. gives a lot of freedom uh, between the, the partners who, who wants to open an application discussion at the end of the day. Uh, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and that startups here uh, that I see arising uh, in Europe, in the US and so on. Uh, so that's really interesting. Again, based on crypto at the end of the day. Uh, but that's very interesting to, to see that coming. And I see more and more requests on that kind of concept. Aside, I would say, the, the standard zero trust approach. And that's, again, a new opportunity which comes uh, from the market here. And that's very interesting to see that. It's it aside, not in competition, but aside with the zero trust approach. And mm -hmm. that's very, very interesting to see that where you see the limit of yeah, what I would call the fallacy of the zero trust in here in that. <laughs> Forgive me about that. Uh, but that's a very interesting approach here you know, to, to see that because you can afford part of your security to a trusted third party. Mm -hmm. There are some parts you don't want due to the regulation, due to confidentiality, whatever. You always have some good reasons. And then you have some new technology here. So that kind of inflection point will be changed or, or will be moved somewhere else in the market. So you still have new opportunities here. And, and for investment, for a VC, uh, I think here it's a new new target uh, that is coming uh, and that will be trending. Uh, I'm helping some here uh, for seeds and so on. And I see a lot of people uh, knocking on the door here on that. So let's keep in mind this uh, zero knowledge uh trend yeah let's see it, uh, if it's uh, yeah, yeah let's see if it's, it's, name, but, uh, <laughs> it's a success yeah yeah um sylvain the, the floor is yours if you have any advice on that yes yes May, maybe you know um well I, i'm not sure that will happen this year but uh you know the fact that we we, we could have um reprioritized spending uh, this year in some companies, even for cyber. Um, and also, if, if you combine this uh, with, with the fact that, for example, a typical bank can have up to 300 cybersecurity products identified in their cyber stack, cyber technology stack, that means there's already, there's a lot of products existing in the cyber stack of companies, um, probably too much probably overlapping, mm. probably sometimes uh, bringing risks to the company itself instead of uh, managing risks. Um, and so to, it's, it's probably time uh, to help these companies um, to have, uh, I mean, a stricter ar architecture approach to cybersecurity that will make more sense. Um, I see, that, of course, there is a trend of buying managed services, for example, MDR services, managed detection of response. I think one of the, that will be coming more and more of those managed services, but the providers, they will know need to bring more assurance for, for example, uh, date, well, private data, confidential data. So I, I think we'll see more architecture approach, more managed services. And when selling a cybersecurity product, it's not anymore selling a magic product that will bring something in addition to what is existing. But what will it replace? And for what business case? What even value created by replacing existing tools? Um, and how the, the, the entire cost will, uh, will change? The TCO, of Excellent. course. Excellent. Yes. Good advice, I guess, when you are doing your business plan and uh, trying to approach the uh, European market, um, which is full of uh, long lasting players that didn't wait for the, the, the perfect product to exist and uh, uh, already equipped themselves with, uh, as you said, maybe too many different solutions. So simplifying is uh, is something that the uh, anglo-saxon world is very good at uh, we can uh, expect a good uh, good surprise um, another trend uh, in the tech 
technological uh, trends that we have uh, seen on the FIC last week is the uh, development of the digital immune system and the different players uh, that have became really uh, mature in this uh, in this field um, it's uh, it's a strong trends according to me according to what i've seen uh, and it's mainly due to the uh, maturity of ai that uh, uh, underlie this uh, this and this um, i would like to to know if the adoption uh, by European organizations is uh, is on its way uh, of the of the DIS digital immune system. Yeah, I would say it's more related to the efficiency of the system they, they, they want to reach. And I will conclude with what Sylvain was just saying. The, the, the target now is to generate efficiency globally and an end-to-end -end protection. So if the system is now able to be inserted in an end-to-end -end security architecture, enterprise security architecture, I would more frame it like that, then it makes sense. If it's just a niche somewhere who will pile up, not really. If it goes inside the flow of the automation to improve the risk, uh, the risk management and stay inside the risk appetite, at the right cost, then yes, that's really what the customers are looking now. And if you come with that uh, reasoning, with that demonstration inside the end-to-end -end automation workflow, then yes, you have something. And then if you can prove that at, at that cost, you can provide better than the existing with the right certainty of the automation that you provide in terms of reaction, without impacting the business? Yes. But you need to prove that you are better than the existing, at least at the same cost. Mm -hmm. And that's very hard to prove. True. So, we are um, looking, <laughs> but we need to make you prove. Yes, you don't. yes, I see also another, let's say, it's, it might be a shortcut to get to, uh, being uh, inside uh, client companies. Um, for example, I have, well, friends have noticed at FIC uh, now, um, let's say, verticalized use cases that come with cyber um, characteristics. Uh, for example, um, executives are looking for a video conferencing and communication solutions that are secure. Um, this stack um, may be fully different than the typical cyber stack that Jerome mentioned, for example, and I mentioned previously. Um, an executive may want that solution. It, it comes with cyber uh, characteristics. You may, maybe you're making it, but it has a direct vertical um, business use for, a, for an exec. And in that situation, it can be a shortcut to you being active in the market, having a new logo, and with a shorter cycle, shorter selling cycle. Good news. OK. Yeah. Um, are there, for example. Sorry, Jérôme? You have some solution dedicated for board exchange, for example. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. That's OK. It could be also for uh, for CFOs, for example, because CFOs, they still have a, a huge load of financial applications, accounting applications that are not secured. So if you come up with a solution that caters to this business case, of course, the CISO, the IT manager, they will not come to bother you. <laughs> they will, they can give their opinion, but they will not bother you. 
Another solution uh, seems to be um, to seems to make a consensus. Uh, it's blockchain using the blockchain uh, to increase the resilience of networks to uh, get strong authentication. Uh, many other applications are coming out of uh, the um, uh, the use of blockchain. Uh, do you think that European companies will take the risk to introduce uh, this in in their system? Well, I see it starting. Uh, what is interesting here is that uh, blockchain per se is pretty well secured. So on that, okay, fair enough. What is really interesting is the smart contract by itself, which is the most insecure part of the blockchain, in fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I already do it. I start to, to deliver for customers. Uh, smart contract security I'll say analysis uh, real-time analysis of the smart contract code uh, because the real risk business risk is there when you do live live smart contract acceptance at the code speed that's a very high risk in fact so you need to be able to scan that and uh, and have a direct connection to the cyber defense center so that's here, the, 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 uh, a new trend here in, in risk management uh, of, of those, uh, let's say, blockchain uh, outcome uh, usage. Uh, and that's really interesting to, to address that. Uh, you know, where we are a step further in the, in the usage of the blockchain. But then in terms of market volume, no, that's not yet big. I don't see that uh, reaching uh, billions uh, <laughs> next year, but okay. it's growing, uh, not rocket speed yet, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe we see. Confidence uh, is growing. Uh, anyway. <laughs> more the techie here, uh, but yeah, uh, it's happening. But uh, I think when the smart contract will be secure, then it will be a bit different. Okay. Um, any any idea on that before we uh, go to another topic, uh, Sylvain? Um, no, I have. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I have no insight, no specific insights on the, on the blockchain. Uh, uh, apart from uh, yeah, like like Jerome is saying, the technology itself uh, is reliable, but it's the way we use it and the way it's integrated with the the, the system uh, that is. Subject to flaws, yes. Okay, that's great. Just like Swift, for example. Like what? Swift, Swift, the payment system. Oh yes, the global okay. payment system. The, mm. the flaws are not happening within Swift itself, but with the interface with the company system. Um, so in the ales of uh, FIC last week, uh, we uh, we have uh, discussed uh, many times the uh, need for new socks. Uh, so these um, these uh, security operation centers uh, seems to be uh, really trending as uh, there is. It seems that there is room for a new new entrance on the market as well. Um, did you did you notice the same uh, kind of trend? Uh, what is your prevision on that? Hard to have one on that one, uh, really, because when you look at it, uh, most mature have. Uh, then you see that the the, the company who have real big uh, cyber defense centers. And we operate quite big ones, so I'm pretty in the center of it. Uh, are overloaded uh, by information, by attacks, uh, and it's a nightmare to to manage. Uh, with a lot of fatigue uh, from the teams to to manage that. Uh, so they need a lot of support, uh, technological support here to be able to to manage. Uh, all those uh, new informations, new log source, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's really hard while you have on top of that a scarcity of people. Mm -hmm. 
and in front more and more attacks, especially with the uh, uh, war uh, warfare and so on, uh, who are using that. So yes. that's a real pain. Uh, so that means that we need to reinvent it. And what I see is that what usually has been created is a big monster ingesting a lot of logs. And you, you end up with a big monstrous data lake. And mm. if you make a parallel with what is happening in data analytics, they are starting to move to data mesh architecture. So they add those monsters of data and they are starting to cut it in more manageable data lakes, which are controlled by data owners. And maybe, and I can't predict it, that will be true, but maybe in cyber, we should move in that kind of direction. The CISO being owning the overall control of cyber and will delegate part of the control to some specialist will own smaller data lakes, like an identity uh, a specialist who will own the cyber identity risk. Someone will own a railway cyber uh, risk. Someone will own a vehicle cyber risk and so on. And then you will have kind of a, a meta governance of the global risk with a size of cockpit. And maybe that will be the, the future with. But for that, we need to have new opportunities coming in the, in the world of cyber with kind of a cyber data bus somewhere like that in the middle. And it starts to be there. In, in Europe, we have the uh, OpenXDR platform.io initiative uh, with French startup uh, building that. Uh, you have the same coming in the US uh, with the OCSF framework uh, with players like Splunk, AWS, and others uh, in it. So it starts to be there. So might be the future year. Uh, but we need big players and also startups developing that kind of uh, story uh, about that kind of bidirectional data bus. But then we need a global uh, agreement between all those, uh, let's say, cyber niche players. Mm -hmm. uh, with their, and when I say niche, I even include, uh, when you look at the, the, the big cyber players, because when you look at it, uh, except players like Palo Alto who are a billion dollar companies. Mm. Uh, globally for the IT world, every cyber company is a small niche, is a small company, <laughs> except maybe one or two. <laughs> but when you look from a global financial standpoint, every cyber player is a small one. So. I see. Sylvain, maybe uh, uh, interesting. your point of view. Because yeah, it's, yeah. uh, it's many, many challenges ahead, yeah. I really yeah, like yeah. Jerome's idea of data mesh, cyber data mesh, and uh, uh, data earners, and uh, also the cyber cockpit, cockpit for the CISO um, built on that. Um, but you know, I, I, I came to realize um, only uh, a few weeks back, I, I know I should have realized that sooner, uh, that uh, the, most of the SOCs, they, they are built to identify the next best course of action for adverse events, real time, right? We agree on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do we manage the data for vulnerabilities, for example, and for non-compliance for, for regulations? We don't have that uh, real time approach to this type of data today. It's captured in different tools and it's not within a single let's say, intelligence platform. Mm. So we have definitely, there is in the market, cyber intelligence platform, cyber intelligence threats, but focused on threat, threat intelligence platforms. Yes, there is. But what is probably missing to, to help this CISO and, the, and their team to, to, to tackle this mix, it's to have this, what maybe we could call cyber intelligence platform and, uh, that would bring together and come with actionable actions, uh, bring together the incident information, of course, there is threat information, there is, but also vulnerability management information, non-compliance against regulatory uh, regulations as well. And the question is, 
what is the best use I can make of my existing resources as a CISO, my teams, uh, my um, my business correspondence, business CISOs uh, that I have across the group, um, the IT guys, production, development. How could I make the best use of these resources? Not only the SOC and my analysts. Excellent. Um... So we need to think in six months, I'll tell you. Sorry, <laughs> John. We need to discuss in six months. Yes. <laughs> ah, so, yeah, there, there would be uh, big uh, opportunities once again uh, in, yeah, in yeah. finding yeah, a solution to yeah. these challenges. Um, uh, I can tell you that, uh, in, in the startup uh, world that I see here in France, uh, it's really rising uh, that, uh, that new approach. Okay. Um, before we uh, uh, wrap up this uh, excellent discussion, um, because I said it should uh, last 45 minutes, but we are already at 50. Um, you, you are a very good advisor at uh, go-to-market strategies, and uh, especially between uh, North America and uh, France. So on the one hand, French customers are, uh, I, I've, I've heard so many times that French customers are slow to adopt innovation. And on the other hand, they are exceptionally loyal and um, this leads to long sales cycles, but uh, to quite good, uh, uh, yes, loyalty uh, in the end. But so what are the winning strategies to, to, to make the most uh, of this situation and to find, fight against this situation, according to you? Maybe, uh, Sylvain, you, you have uh, some insights. Um, yeah, I have, I have seen uh, strategies like this. I have I have worked with the, within the company for well uh, with the same challenge in the past. Um, mm. What what I could say is that there are accelerators. Um, accelerators could be, for example, if your technology involves an open source component, then uh, the the customer can try it or even only have the idea that uh, he will be free, even if he needs your help to try it, uh, to put it in, into a, a production in a, in a pilot setting. So, of course, you might know already this. Um, another way is if your solution does not involve, of course, any, any setup, any IT connection, uh, some observability solutions do that. Uh, for example, to monitor the attack surface of a given organization. So it makes it very quick to demonstrate the, uh, the, the value of it. Um, and um, yeah, starting, starting small, demonstrating the value and then growing uh, is probably the way. But um, I have no silver bullet on that. <laughs> the, the, there might be another point here and which goes to the loyalty part, which is very true. Uh, usually in North America, uh, customer goes to the vendor and then find someone to to help uh, deploying the, the product. While in Europe, if you want to go faster uh, to the market, it usually goes the opposite way. That's why you need a channel. Uh, in France, Belgium, South, Southern Europe mainly, because you go first to the, the, the guy you trust to, to deploy your IT, to maintain your IT and your cyber, and then maybe after you will see the vendor, except for the big companies, more structured company who have a big team, but for the vast majority of the market, they will go first to their trusted advisor. So you need a channel for that. And that's very different from uh, North America also, in terms of behavior, or UK also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. If I may add, Thomas, um, yeah. one of the things that the French companies I have seen struggle with is uh, making, preparing the RFP documents. So mm -hmm. if you come up through your partner or through direct connections, or an influencer with your target companies with uh, a, a typical RFP template. Of course, 
uh, that will help the customer, but that will also help you to uh, put uh, the typical characteristics of your solution, right? So you you should probably come up with uh, um, uh, an end-to-end -end approach as to or almost consultative approach to help the customer to understand better their requirement and also to talk with the market uh, openly. Um, and of course, they will still work with you and most probably they will work with you. Yeah, the, the, the importance of, uh, yes, um, the uh, uh, call for proposal and uh, the uh, the framework that you have to 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 be into. Um, yes, thank you very much. We are uh, reaching the, the end of the, the time we said we, we will use. So uh, thank you. Thank you for your insights. Um, any last word, any last advice before uh, we uh, leave? Uh, maybe uh, just one word you would say to uh, a foreign company interested in developing its uh, technology solution in France. Uh, what is uh, your tip? There's a lot to do, but adapt to Southern uh, Europe, basically. And Paris is a very good spot because you can reach all Europe from Paris very easy. <laughs> I would say okay. that. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Maybe Sylvain. Well, um, I think the French are more and more open to international anything than they used to be in the past, even in cyber. Um, and uh, yeah, you should definitely come and uh, uh, come preferably for the long run because then you will have more success. Uh, it's not just uh, uh, let's try it with a snap and if make make a raid and then come back. No, it's it's uh, it's it's not only a tactical approach. You should have a strategic approach to it. You can build it step by step, but having a strategic approach to it really helps and will give you way more success. And of course, uh, as Jerome said, work with channels, partners like Capgemini, also be integrated in an ecosystem uh, it's important uh, and if of course you want to communicate uh, also on the long run uh, with newsletters like shakers there's an opportunity thank you thank you uh, to both of you well done uh, and um, uh, so let's uh, meet at rsa conference and uh, in the meantime uh, good luck. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.